time here. <laughs> it gives me great pleasure to introduce Rob Campbell. He's going to be talking about Nagios at our meeting tonight. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Good? Okay. Um, I've been asked a lot about Nagios Core and some of the core components of it. Uh, I just kind of want to scope this out. Well, first I'll give you a little bit of background about myself. Um, my name is Robert Campbell. Uh, I work in the IT security industry. Um, I've worked initially in Windows servers, but I've gradually moved uh, more toward Linux in the last two to three years. So that's where I was introduced to Nagios. Uh, the last place I worked at, uh, I used it uh, quite extensively. So uh, just to kind of give you a little overview. Um, so those of you who don't know what Nagios is, it's a very customizable monitoring system. Uh, it can monitor just about anything. Um, the core version is free, so there is a Nagios commercial product out there now, which is called Nagios XL. <coughs> XI. Uh, th this is going to cover the open source version, so this will, you can download this and use wherever you want. Um, so with the core version, the configuration is through the command line, uh, but you can monitor and manage your alerts through Web UI. So we'll touch base on both. Most of the presentation will be in the command line uh, configuration settings, but we'll look into the uh, Web UI as well. Um, so it has alerting capability with the ability to escalate um, response capability through the web. And what I mean by that is when an alert uh, generates, uh, somebody can log into it, they can put down what the alert was, if they're working on it, they can put status updates right there in the program. Um, it's got reporting metrics, so you can pull up a host, you can see a historical record of outages, events, alerts, and notifications that have been uh, triggered on that system, so it keeps a nice little uh, history of events on there. Uh, you can do scheduled maintenance. Uh, there's actually two ways you can do it. You can uh, schedule a downtime, just set the actual time, or you can do what's called a, um, uh, it's like an offset. So you can say, this should take one hour, and then when it first goes down, it will count from an hour from there, and then it bring back up. So it gives some flexibility in your scheduled downtime. Um, it helps with planning. So for example, you can monitor CPU usage, memory usage, uh, number of users on a system, you can track that capacity trend and you can anticipate when you need to do an infrastructure upgrade or when you need to upgrade to replace certain servers. Um, and then the capability of it can be greatly extended through Nagios plugins, which we'll briefly touch on. Um, there's, a lot, there's a lot in this, so this is going to be more on the core components of Nagios and how they interact with each other. But we will briefly uh, uh, touch base on the plugins. Uh, so I have a demo set up, so we're going to do a little bit of hands-on with it. Um, the demo version is version 4.08, which is the most current <coughs> version out uh, right now. I have installed on a Red Hat system uh, in Amazon AWS, so I kind of use that. I'm using like the free tier as kind of like a little test environment. Um, the demo, as I previously mentioned, will focus on the core components. Um, as I mentioned, it has a very modular design, so it's important to understand how each module interacts with the other one because it starts looping into each other a lot. So it's, and it's very flexible in the way that you can design it. So you can look at a system, and it can, one system can be completely different than another one. So if you know the core interactions and how it works, you can be, look at any of the systems and be able to understand how it works. Uh, and then we're gonna do a quick review of the built-in plugins and commands that are available. And then we'll also uh, briefly review the remote monitoring of local resources on Linux and Windows systems. So it has the ability to review CPU usage, memory, um, <coughs> current logged in users, all those local items remote. <coughs> so we'll go into that as well. So I apologize for the next few slides of wall of text, but this is, I did put this in here just for completion purposes. Um, I already have it installed just to save on time for the presentation. So this is just a quick overview. Um, those four things at the top there, Apache, PHP, GCC compiler, or any C++ compiler and then the development libraries you need to have installed. Uh, just a quick note on this, I am installing this from source, so it is a little bit more agnostic to the systems. I'm not using an RPM package or anything like that, so this is a, uh, a source code install. Uh, you'll become a root user, or you can you know, just run sudo. Um, you need to create a Nagios user account uh, and a uh, Nagios group as well. So you'll see there some commands to create the, the group and the account. Once you have that set up, um, you download uh, the Nagios core installation, and then you download the plugins. You'll need, yes? Will your presentation be available? Yes. 
Yeah, I can make it available. Yep. And that's kind of why I put this in here, because I, I kind of wanted for completeness to actually kind of the actual install instructions. Um, so these two links here are actually for uh, the most current version. So the current version of uh, plugins is up to 2.03, and then that's the Nagios 4.08 or 4.08. Um, so you download those. Um, you extract the TARs, uh, you compile them. Uh, an important thing when you run it, uh, when you run the configure script, you want to do with command group in AGCMD. So it's going to install it as the Nagios uh, group. Uh, so you don't want to have root privileges on all those accounts because you don't want to run this in root. Um, and then we'll go into more on how that works with interacting with other systems. Um, so then you'll compile the code. Uh, then you'll just do you know the regular make install. Your install the initialization script, uh, the config in the command mode, um, and then to configure the web interface, you just do a make install web config, and it will copy over a file in the Apache config directory. Uh, from there, you can create a Nagios admin account, or you can name it whatever you want. Uh, just from the standard naming conventions, they usually call it Nagios admin. Uh, you restart Apache to make the settings take effect. That, then you have to do the plugin install. So this is important. So when you actually install Nagios core, uh, you're not going to be able to really monitor anything until you install the plugins. So the next step on it is to install the plugins. Uh, very similar process. You want to run it with the configure with user Nagios. Um, you do the make make install. Um, this uh, command here, just under start Nagios, which says verify the sample Nagios configuration files. This is a very important um, command, and you will run it. Using this system, so what I suggest doing is just going into your your Bash profile and just making an alias. I call my Nagios underscore check, and then you just type that in, and you don't have to type this out every single time. And I'll go more into that um, as well. But what that does is it does a pre-flight. So anytime you make any changes in configuration, it'll do a pre-flight. It'll check all your files and tell you if there's any problems. And it is extremely good at catching syntax errors. So it's a very good thing to run anytime you make it. Change in program, um, so it'll kick back, and we'll see what uh, the screen looks like when it kicks back. Uh, it'll tell you zero errors, errors, and if there is, then you just service uh, Nagios start and it starts right up. So now we'll go ahead and get into some of the core components. And probably can't see that too well, but I'm just going to go ahead and jump into uh, the actual files as well, so we can see them a little bit better. Uh, so the, the first thing we'll talk about. When Nagios installs, if you're installing it from source code, it's going to be, it's going to put itself under user local Nagios. And then from there, all the other directories are located there. And we're going to go into some of the core components and how, how to set them up and how they work with each other. So the first thing we're going to look at is Nagios.cfg, which is the main configuration uh, component. So we'll go ahead and jump in there. So this is uh, my Nagios install. Uh, it's just running on a, an AWS instance. Um, and this is running on Red Hat. So this, these, uh, it's pretty, when you do the source code install, it's, it's pretty much going to be the same from any system. Uh, there will be slight differences for like installing it as a service uh, between different flavors of Linux. But uh, this is like an RPM based install. So you go ahead and jump into this file. Um, this basically tells where all those files are at. So it lists like log file and everything like that. Uh, there's not much you have to change in here. There's really nothing out of the box that you have to change on this particular uh, file. But one thing that is very important to know is the object configuration files. So that's these ones right here. So initially out of the box, it's set up uh, and it comes with a few sample configuration files. And you'll see them listed here. So you see that CFG file equals and it lists it out. Uh, Nagios will process any file at any location with the .cfg extension as long as it's defined here. Now for organizational purposes you want to put them all in the same area so it's easier. But the important thing to remember is if you make a new configuration file, you make a new host, and if you don't put it in here, it's not going to show up on Nagios. So you can quickly see how this could be a headache for large deployments. So I would not recommend using the .cfg file at all. There's another section down here called .cfg directory. 
so CFG underscore DIR. There you'll list an actual directory, and then any .cfg files you put in that directory will be processed by Nyquist. If they're not in there, and if they're not called out in this file, they will not be processed. So that's an important point um, to know about the main configuration file. Um, other than that, there's not much else that really needs to change here unless you want to change where it runs its PID file or where it runs its log. I mean, if you really want to get into that, you can, but it's pretty compartmentalized within the user local uh, Nyquist. So that's the main thing uh, that we want to look at here, is uh, basically defining a directory for our configuration files. Uh, the next file is hosts and services. Uh, so these are two very important concepts uh, to know about now is the host's definitions in the file that have the service definitions. So every single um, thing that's going to be checked in here is either going to be a host check or a service check. Uh, in the way Nagios works is you can put these any way you want. So for example, you can make a host.cfg file and put all your hosts in there and do all the host checks for that one file. You can make a services.cfg file and do that. I've seen it done in deployments. It's very hard to manage. Uh, what I really recommend is making a .cfg file for each host. So what you're going to do is you're going to define the host in that file, and you're going to find all the services on that host. So you are going to have to repeat configuration of the service definitions a lot. But what I usually do is I'll just, like if I'm deploying a new web server, I'll just copy a current web server that's similar, and I'll just go in there and edit it so I don't have to retype the entire page. And it makes it much easier to organize. So you can make directories like Linux servers, web servers, uh, file servers, and then in each one you, put, you can put the host name or IP of the server and define all the uh, service and uh, host definitions within that file. It just makes it a lot easier uh, to manage. And again, so I'm fine. I can go back to full screen on it because it keeps kicking me out of the So let's go ahead and jump back in here real quick. And we'll take a look. So right now, this is what you're going to see uh, when you first, this is the Etsy directory. So you first install, this is kind of what you're going to see. Uh, most of your configuration <laughs> files are going to be in the Etsy directory. So once you go into here, you'll see it gives you a couple um, section of objects. <coughs> so it gives you a couple um, samples, and we'll go into these as well. Um, if you in that configuration file, it did have the switch uh, Windows printer uh, commented out. And the reason why is because they're just kind of samples that you can use. They're not actually being read and processed by Nagios. The rest of these are, and we'll go into each one of these individually. Um, I usually like to start off with looking at an actual uh, system uh, configuration file. So let's go ahead. This is called nexus.cfg. Uh, this is basically just my home server at home. I set this up to monitor it. It's just a sync, uh, simple ping uh, service. Uh, and basically what it does is it will make a availability chart of how often my, uh, I was having some signal uh, issues. So I was just tracking this. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll go into each item in here. Um, so you want to you want to do a host definition first. So you define host, and then you uh, use the use command, which uses a template file. And we will get into templates in a minute. Uh, the template files is where all your main configuration takes place. And it makes, if you look at this, this is the full file here for this uh, host definition and service. Uh, when you get into templates, you'll see it makes creating these much easier because you define all your upfront uh, configuration in the template files. And then you just invoke this use command and it brings all that in. And then you just customize it to your one service. So we'll get into templates uh, in the next section and I'll show you how that works. So you want to do a host name. And you can define the host. Um, you can name this whatever you want. It doesn't have to be the actual host name of the system. Uh, usually it's a good idea to make it that. Um, the important thing, though, is that when you do the host name, anytime you want to tie a service to that host, you have to remember the host name because you're going to be calling out the host name. You're not going to be calling out the alias or the actual address. You're going to be calling out the host name. Um, so then you set the alias, which is basically all the alias does is when you get to the web GUI, it gives you kind of a friendly name. <coughs> whatever you want. Um, and then the address. Now, for this particular one, since this is just a home server, 
I put down the actual DNS address, which you can do. Uh, they do recommend, though, and it depends on what kind of checks you want, to put the actual IP. So your checks won't fail if something happens with DNS. So if there's a problem with DNS, your, your host checks will still go through. But you can change that and make that a uh, DNS name if you want. Um, so that's kind of a sample host definition. And then we'll jump into a sample service definition here. So I like, so like I was explaining before, I like to keep it all in one file for that one particular um, system. And then when we get to the web GUI, I'll show you how it, it you know, puts it all together. Uh, so this is a service definition. So you have defined service. And then we invoke that use command as well because uh, there are also service templates. So it's just as there's host templates, there's service templates. So we're using a local service template. Um, once again, that uh, host name ties it to that host. So this is how, this is the important thing uh, to tie your service definitions to your hosts. Uh, you put down a service description. This is just a simple ping command. And then you put the actual check command. So this is check ping. Uh, you can set, you know, these are the actual examples on here. So 20%. Uh, 60% it'll alert you uh, latency. Um, and then, so the first number is a warning, the second number is critical. We'll get uh, more into that when we get to the uh, templates. Uh, so that's kind of like a, a brief overview of one of the configuration files. And we'll see how that works with all the rest of it in a minute. Uh, so the next part is uh, contacts. Uh, so once again, this is located in the objects directory. Uh, it's used to define anyone who will receive alerts. And you can do it by email or text. Uh, you can set up <coughs> contact groups so that multiple people can be assigned to the group. Uh, that's actually what I recommend. Instead of assigning a contact to a particular uh, host or service, you assign a group, and then it makes it much easier as people move through the organization to add or remove the group than it does going into every single configuration file and changing it. Uh, so we'll go ahead and we'll jump into that. <coughs> so this is what it looks like. Uh, this is going to be the uh, default one they give you. Um, and then, so contact name, uh, that can be anything you want. Uh, once again, that's going to be referenced by other things, so I would not put spaces in there. So usually if you're, uh, think of this as like a user. And then here's that use command again. So once again, this is pulling from templates. And we'll get to templates in just a second. Um, alias is the friendly name for it. So this is the Nagios admin account. And then this is where you define the email at. Um, and then contact groups are very similar as well. Uh, you define the group, assign it a name, and then under members, uh, to add more to this, you just put a comma, and you just add uh, as many people as you want. So a common thing is to put all your IT people contacts in here, uh, and then make like a web services group, a file services group, whatever departments that you have run that you want to assign to groups of servers. And then you'll assign those contact groups to the actual definition. And how that works is when you go into um, the service definition or host definition, you can type in there contact group and you put the name of the group and those are the people who will be um, notified uh, if any issues happen on that device. So that's the contact. So this is our next one, it's the template CFG. This is actually a pretty important file. Um, it's used to create templates for uh, host and service checks as well as contact notifications, so it does all three. Um, it's invoked using the use command. And uh, multiple templates can be configured, so you can make as many templates as you want. You can customize them as detailed as you want. We'll take a look, look at uh, some in a bit here. Uh, it greatly reduces the time to set up those individual configuration files. As you see, they're very light most of the actual configuration is in the template itself. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at one of those. So this is the contact template. Now, so what this does is this is where you set all your actual checks. Uh, so for example, this one's called generic contact. So when you use the use command, you can reference generic contact, and all these items will be applied to that contact that you're creating. So these are service notification here 24-7. Uh, 
you can set, so say for example, you have a set of servers that are not critical, and you only want alerts during the workday, you don't want alerts at night or on the weekend. You can set your notification period to work hours. And we'll go into, uh, there's actually, and this is how it's very modular, there's a time periods.cfg file that we'll look into as well, and that will show it as well. Um, and then you can set the host notification period, uh, and then you set the host notification options. So these are the options of what it's going to alert on. Uh, so W is warning, uh, U is uh, it's unreachable, C is critical, R is recovery, uh, F is flapping, so if it's going up and down, up and down, and then S is for scheduled maintenance. So typing these in here is basically telling it what alerts you want to receive. So if you only want to see warning and critical alerts, you don't want to see when it's back up, you can do that. If you only want to see an alert when it's back up, you can do that as well. So you can really customize exactly what you want to see. Uh, and then same thing with the uh, host service options. Uh, very similar. It's a little bit different syntax, so it's down, up, recover, uh, flapping, and then schedule state. So you can set those there, um, and then you can tell service um, by email and host by email. So this will tell you uh, if you want to actually notify the individuals on the contact group by email uh, for the service and host notifications. So you can set up a system uh, to just notify the actual web UI and not actually send out any alerts if you really wanted to. But right here, this tells you, you know, it will send an alert. So this is the um, generic. Uh, this register item here, zero, basically what that's telling the system is that this is not a configuration file, this is a template, do not process this information. Um, so that's kind of an example of a contact uh, template. And as you see through here, uh, there's many uh, host templates. So there's a generic host, there's a Linux host, uh, there's a Windows host. And I won't go through all the different ones on here. You can, here's uh, examples here to tell you exactly what it's doing. But this is basically to fine tune uh, your installation. So you can go in here, you can say uh, check interval five. That means it's going to check every five minutes. So if you have systems that need to be up near real time, you can set it very uh, quick uh, checks. If you've got a system that you don't want checks on so often, you want to cut down the traffic, you can set that for like 30 minutes. Uh, retry interval, interval is an important one because that's basically when it detects that it's down, it's going to keep retrying it every minute. So it, it ups its, its checks against the host. So it'll check trying every minute until it gets a uh, uh, positive response back. Or it'll keep uh, emailing as well. Uh, and then max check attempts is how many checks you want. So there's what's called a soft uh, fail and a hard fail. The soft fail is like if you set max check attempts to three, and let's say it doesn't, let's say you're doing a ping test and it pings it twice, it's not going to alert you until it fails on that third time. So if there's a, a slight blip, uh, it's not going to alert you for every single uh, little thing. And you can modify this. So if you have a system that's more tolerant to having uh, slight blips in downtime, you can set that. Or if you want to immediately know, you can say max check check attempts one the first time it fails, it's going to alert you. So those are some of the items that you can set in the templates uh, file itself. Um, the important thing about templates is uh, any single one of these commands can be put in a host configuration file to make it specific for that one host. So let's say you have a template for your web servers, and you have it checked every three minutes or something. But you have one that's more important, and you want to check every one minute. You can uh, type in the check interval, and you can put that specific to that configuration file, and that will always override the template setting. So what's defined in the configuration files themselves will always override the template, so it's important to remember. And they don't uh, build on each other. So for example, in here you have contact groups. So this is how you set who gets notified. By default, uh, the admins group, which is where the Nagios admin account is setting, gets notified. Uh, if you change <coughs> the system to say contact groups and you put like web servers, it doesn't mean web servers and the admins will be notified, only web servers. So it's important if you are changing that to add as many as you want in the configuration file because it completely overrides it. It doesn't build on it, it just overrides and wipes out that um, template setting. So it acts like a default. If there's yes. nothing set for that Pretty specific yeah. thing, this is what you do. Exactly. Yep. So when you when you say use and you invoke that um, that template, it's going to use that unless otherwise told. Yep. So, uh, that's just kind of a review on that. So this is kind of a, a good thing to go into and, and look at. So 
and as you can see, the service templates, there's a lot more on here. So there's a lot of, um, you can do paralyzed checks, passive checks, active checks. Um, there's a lot of information in here that you can really fine tune on your service checks. Uh, and the cool thing about this is, you know, there, there's no limit to as many as templates as you want. You can make as many as you want. Or if you have a specific single use case, you can just define it within that configuration file itself. And it. It, is there a way to um, configure some of this by the notification group? For the, the, mm -hmm. We have Nagios where I'm at and I've tweaked some things, but I, I'm still learning stuff. Okay. One of the things that drives me up the wall is We've got it set to notify every hour, okay. we, which via email doesn't bug me. But we've also set it up where it's sending me text messages yes. every yeah, hour. The same and, issue and, somebody else. You know, and <coughs> so I mean, a, a you Saturday I was out of yeah. town, and you know we had a server down, and so all night long my phone kept ding, if, ding. If you to handle that, there's a couple ways to handle. So I mean, if there's, if you want the text messages for that, if you don't want the text messages for that system, you can actually make another contact user with just email, well, and use that. But if you want the, you want the alerts on a regular basis, but you, if it's there's a problem, and you don't want um, to keep receiving them, you log into the, when you log into the web UI, you can actually um, acknowledge it. Yep. Well, my ideal would be setting it up where. It emails me every hour because that's fine, but it only texts me when it goes down. Yes, you can do that. Okay. Yep. So what you would do there is you would set up uh, you would set up this template. So like for example, for the service command, you would use like check period twenty four seven, uh, and you would set all this up. So in the template, you would say contact groups, and you would call it um, web servers email, right? You would have to set that particular contact group. To only have email addresses, uh, and at that point it will always it, it'll email no matter what. Then you would set up a second template that instead of twenty four seven, you can change it, or you can um, basically change the retry interval instead of every hour to make it every ten hours or something, or every twelve hours. You can basically extend out when it's going to do that check again, or you can extend out when it's going to send that so notification again. Is that a second host definition or separate? Uh, no, no, it would be a separate. Uh, <coughs> uh, so from the two con and then you would sign those contacts uh, to it, and then basically in that contact definition, it would treat them different. Okay. So you would do that uh, in the contact groups. Because you can, you can put notification period in the contact group, in the contact template. Yes. So uh, notification period is going to be on um, like a template, basically. But you would reference the contact group itself. So you would basically want it so that one of the contact groups you only had emails on, and yeah. the other one you had texting emails. Yeah. And then you would uh, use each template separately. You could use each template on the one device. And then basically, you know, the one will fall off because it won't be able to email it or it won't be able to text you, uh, where the email ones will keep going. I can send you like a Part of it is I got to look at, at our config files and how we're set up. Because because we had I, the same we had the same issue with somebody before. They were getting the alerts on their phone, and they were like, "I can get the alerts during the the day or whatever, but I want them on my phone at night." So we ended up making them a, a separate uh, contact group and assigned it differently. Yeah. Well, and part of it is also trying to get my coworkers into the discipline of going in. And acknowledging it when they're that's, working yeah. on it. That's because yeah. that will cut those right down. Yeah. Once it's acknowledged, it'll stop. Make it bring, make it send text to them. <laughs> <laughs> make it their problem. There actually is a way to to do acknowledgments like through text message or through you know really? through a variety. Yeah. I failed at configuring it. Yeah, I've not, several, I've not seen one of those. That's interesting, yeah. Yeah, because you can you can actually configure with that, uh, I think it's Negio CMD file okay. that'll take in commands in Negios. So basically, you just need to write the back end for that. You 
Okay. Yeah, so we're actually we'll, we'll jump into the commands file. Again too. <coughs> yeah, yeah. I've never seen it before. That's interesting. I have to play with it a little bit. I had it like working very minimally for like only me 